Thanks for having me. The objectives here, we want to talk about the concept of synthetic lethality in the context of BRCA deficient tumors. You know, you, you've heard about this, you know BRCA matters. Why does it matter? Of course, it matters because of the implication in terms of screening and familial significance. It also matters in terms of treatment because we are getting closer to having uh, established treatments for, for this specific subset of patients, and I'm going to go over some of that data. We'll go over some of the, actually, I'm sorry, we're not going to go over the basics regarding ovarian cancer. I edited that out just recently. We'll talk about um, PARP inhibition. We'll talk about why all this matters. So, you know, very simply, prostate cancer is a BRCA-associated malignancy, along with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and pancreatic cancer. And, you know, we keep making this point. I know this crowd knows this point, but really most of the medical community still hasn't absorbed this point. I gave a talk on this just a couple of weeks ago to a community of primary care physicians and asked them how many of them ask their female patients about their fathers and brothers with prostate cancer, and the answer is almost none of them. And no one asks about pancreas, and no one asks their male patients about their mothers and their sisters with breast and ovarian cancer. So we can see here that amongst localized cancers, having a germline aberration, deleterious alteration in BRCA2 carries an almost eight and a half fold relative risk of prostate cancer, and BRCA1 almost a, a three and a half fold relative risk of prostate cancer over patients without these aberrations. BRCA2 is about five times more common than BRCA1, so it's what, what we spend most of our time talking about, at least in prostate cancer patients, that is. And that's the opposite of what you see in ovarian and breast cancers. But it's associated with higher Gleason score, higher stage, and younger age of diagnosis. Right? So the question was asked earlier about how does this impact PSA screening guidelines, and the answer is it doesn't yet, but I think we all know it needs to, so that's a, uh, something in development as far as the data to think about what do we, how do we counsel uh, the patients with a germline inherited BRCA mutation. They are considered high risk by NCCN guidelines. Of course, that was always one of the things about the USPSTF stance is it never applied to high risk patients, yet of course those patients were probably ignored as well because that nuance was lost on most practitioners. There's never been a debate that amongst high risk patients, PSA screening has remained appropriate, but then, you know, the question is where do you, when do you start? What age is the cutoff three? Should it be age 45? Of course, we could have a, another pro con about that or perhaps ask Dr. Carlson and Dr. Parsons what they think. But amongst lethal prostate cancer, 60% of mutation carriers of BRCA1, 2, and ATM report a negative family history. And that's one of the most important points I think everyone needs to take home is that family history doesn't tell you who to test. Okay? So how do we know that? Well, this data was reported at ASCO uh, a little over a year ago now. It looked at over 1,100 patients with localized prostate cancer who had germline DNA testing. In that population, 199 of them had a high-risk germline mutation. And then what they did is they took that cohort of 199 patients and they compared their family history to the existing NCCN guidelines and said, if you follow the guidelines strictly, how many of them would you catch? And the answer is only 63%, almost 37% of the patients who were carrying inherited deleterious mutations would not have qualified for screening by guidelines. Okay, so, so we can definitively say, look, the guidelines don't work. And this is just the NCCN guidelines. There's others, but they all fall into the same category, right? They ask how many first degree relatives do you have with this list of cancers? But what if you're an orphan, right? What if you come from a small family, you have no siblings and your parents each have one or no siblings? Median number of children in the U.S. today in a family is two, right? So those kind of guidelines work really well if you come from a large family of eight children and, and whatnot, then you can use family history. But for most Americans nowadays, this isn't going to work. So we're not doing it right, okay? And, then, and I think this is probably the most important point for people to take home and thinking about when do you test patients? The answer is probably not family history, okay? That's not how you decide. So then, the next step in thinking about this, though, I mean, we, we always talk about, we had this 40-year-long conversation, right, about the tortoises and the rabbits, 
right? How do you detect the lethal cancers? Those are the ones we really need to worry about. Don't worry about the ones that aren't going to kill the patients, and we've already heard a lot of conversation about that. So if we look at the metastatic population, I mean, these are the men that are going to die of prostate cancer, right? With the development of measurable metastatic disease by conventional imaging, maybe not the newest imaging, but by conventional imaging, 80% of those men will die of prostate cancer, not with it. Those are my patients, right? By the time they get to me, these men are going to die of their disease. They're not going to die with it. And in that population, we see that the overall rate of germline mutations is much higher. About 10 to 12 percent of all men with metastatic disease will have inherited deleterious mutations in cancer-associated genes, and almost half of those are going to be BRCA2. You add BRCA1 and 2 together, and you're talking about 51 percent of patients. So about 5 percent of all of my patients are going to have a germline aberration in BRCA1 and 2, about 1 to 2 percent of localized patients. But of course, BRCA1 and 2 and ATM, I mean, this family of genes is, is only part of the list. You know, as we know now in this modern era where we have TCGA, we have large-scale large sequencing studies across tumor types, there is a long list of very common aberrations in any given cancer, and those might be mutations, they might be fusions, they might be amplifications, and then there's a long tail of less common alterations. And in prostate cancer, what we see, as in every other cancer, is that it is not one monolithic disease, right? It's not every prostate cancer is the same, and you all know this. You have patients with Gleason 6 prostate cancer who develop metastases very early and die, and you have men with Gleason 9 prostate cancers who you thought, you know, this guy's in trouble, and 15 years later, he's still coming back to your clinic and nothing has happened, right? So it isn't one monolithic disease. There is a, a variety of distinct pathways active in prostate cancer. And what there really ought to be, what there needs to be, is multiple different treatment paradigms based upon the specific type of prostate cancer that a patient has. Now, prostate cancer is still one of the only one of the big four cancers, that is lung, colon, prostate, and breast, without genotypic definition in terms of subtypes of disease and therapies directed to those specific subtypes. So very generally, and, and I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but this is a list of kind of the most common altered genes we see in prostate cancer. And there's a couple of points to take away here. One is that there is evolution across the spectrum of disease. So you start early, and of course, the androgen receptor being, right, the key driver of disease. No surprise that when you move from non-castrate metastatic disease to castrate, you suddenly get AR amplification. Well, we've known that for many years, right? What gets forgotten is a small proportion of patients start out with AR amplification right in the beginning, and in fact, we know these guys are in trouble. They have a very aggressive disease course early on. There's the other alterations that are familiar to everyone here, P10 deletion. No surprise, that gets somewhat more common as we march through the disease states. P53 deletion. P53, recall, is the most commonly mutated gene in all of human malignancy, right? It's a, a master regulator of the cell cycle and repair. And it becomes more frequently aberrant as you move through disease states and get to later stage disease. It's probably a predictor of aggressiveness up front. The question is, is it a predictor or is it a differentiator in terms of treatment? And so far, we don't know. And then it you know, run through the rest of it here. There's BRCA, there's ATM, some other genes. And where this became important then is finally, and you've seen this paper three years ago, this is the first paper that came out that said, you know what, you've got an approved therapy for BRCA mutant disease if you're talking about breast and ovarian cancer. Why don't we go ahead and try this in prostate cancer? I mean, those of us who work in this field have argued this point for many years. I wrote my first IST on something like this back in 2011. Didn't go anywhere. Finally, in 2015, Johan de Bono's group carries the day and shows us a tremendous response rate, right? Here's a PFS using Olaparib, a PARP inhibitor, an improved PARP inhibitor in BRCA or ATM or other um, DNA res damage response gene altered prostate cancer. And they saw a tremendous response rate, but in a single institution, non-randomized study. And, you know, this is one of the things in 
oncology. I mean, we all know that when you have a single institution study that goes from phase two to phase three, you know, you lose about half of your response rate, right? It's, it's always biased when it's single institution. So, so you looked at this and you got, we got FDA breakthrough status for using a laparib. And so maybe you've seen your oncologist use this on some of your patients. But of course, we need the prospective data. And so this is what Dr. Crawford was just referring to. This is data that's only a couple of weeks old. I presented at the Prostate Cancer Foundation meeting uh, last month. And this is looking at rucaparib. So one of the FDA-approved PARP inhibitors in breast and ovarian cancer. This is a phase two study. There's also a companion phase three study going on. So the phase two is happening in the post-docetaxel space. The phase three is happening in the pre-docetaxel space. Do PARP inhibitors work in prostate cancer? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time just in the interest of time on this slide, but the way this works out, right, there's two different populations in metastatic prostate cancer. There's patients with measurable disease, by which we mean soft tissue disease that we can apply standard response criteria to, right, shrinking of tumors versus growing. And then there's patients with non-measurable disease, i.e. those patients with bone-only disease where we don't have radiographic evidence of response, we just have radiographic evidence of non-progression. And it broke it down, stratified patients according to what kind of alteration they had. In, the, in an interim analysis of the first 85 patients enrolled, if you look at the patients with response evaluable, that is resist res evaluable, 45 of them, uh, or I'm sorry, PSA response evaluable, 45 of them had a BRCA alteration, 18 had ATM, another 22 had others, and we won't linger too much on those. 46 patients had radiographic disease that was evaluable, 25 of those 46 having BRCA1-2. And if you look here at the, at the overall response rate by resist criteria, measurable disease, in patients with a BRCA1-2 alteration, the complete and partial response rate was 44%, okay, which is really good in the medical oncology realm. And this is still early because of, because of uh, as you'll see in a later slide, a lot of these patients are still on therapy. This is very much in line and better than quite a few of the currently FDA-approved drugs in prostate cancer. This is what we call a swimmer's plot. So these are all the patients on study re receiving rucaparib with a BRCA1 or 2 alteration. And what this shows you is time on treatment. So that's weeks across the bottom. Each lane, each swim lane then is an individual patient. The arrow means they're still on therapy. So you have a patient there that's 52 weeks out. The red is from the time of initial treatment. The orange is when you develop radiographic response. So what stands out in this slide, number one is most patients develop a response very early. The responders are generally developing a response by eight weeks, so that's a 30% reduction in tumor volume. And you see the majority of responders remain on therapy. Right? We don't even know yet how long the the actual progression-free survival will be, but this is incredibly encouraging early data. And then if you look at the rest of the genes, and then this is an important point, right? We're talking about bucketing patients. How do we take genetic data, turn it into different phenotypes of disease, break down prostate cancer from one monolithic disease to a variety of different diseases? ATM has long been thought of as a DNA damage response gene, but in fact, it's very different than BRCA. It doesn't directly uh, interact with the DNA to fix repairs. It's more of a monitoring gene. And what we see is that PARP inhibitors have almost no efficacy whatsoever in this population. At least rucaparib doesn't. CDK12, another gene that we're going to talk a little bit more about, gets categorized as the DDR gene. But, you know, it's, its function is much different. It leads to a different phenotype of disease that we're going to talk about in a bit. Probably shouldn't be treated with PARP inhibitors at all. And then amongst these others, we saw a response in BRIP1 and FANK-A altered disease. This is the waterfall plot showing by what percentage the tumor shrunk in this population of patients. So all these patients on this end, their tumors grew. All these patients on this end, their tumors shrunk. And the value of a plot like this is instead of getting that arbitrary resist cutoff of 30% as somehow being significant, right, as if the patient with 32% got a benefit and the patient with 28% didn't, this just shows everybody as a composite and gives you a, a, a more global sense of the response. And suffice it, suffice it to say, this is a good response, the red being all the BRCA patients. All right. 
So moving forward, looking at PSA response rate, the PSA response rate in BRCA1 to alter patients, 51%, right? So this is late stage patients already treated with chemotherapy, already treated with abiraterone and enzalutamide. You get a 51% in this population. That's doing very, very well. That's better than anything else we have in this population. And here again is the waterfall plot of the same. So again, this is, this is a very good looking waterfall plot. I mean, this is the kind of results that get us excited in medical oncology. And then here again, ATM, no response, right? So even though ATM and BRC are traditionally bunched together when you talk about it from a genetic perspective, from a malignancy perspective, this is not the same disease. CDK12, very little response as well. Okay, so that's, that's where the field needs to go, right? We are close. Soon, we'll have the first FDA-approved treatment selection biomarker in metastatic disease. We expect it to be BRCA alterations. The specifics of that is something we have to delve into a little further and, and kind of beyond the scope of what I was going to go into here, but in terms of talking about monoallelic loss versus biallelic loss and specifically which alteration should qualify and which ones shouldn't. But we're starting to understand, I mean, there's plenty of emerging data that there's a lot of other phenotypes of disease that matter. So MYC is frequently amplified in metastatic prostate cancer, and we see it amplified in, in about 10 to 20 percent of the disease, and these are patients that are heading down that neuroendocrine small cell pathway. These are patients whose prostate cancer ends up looking like small cell lung cancer. And at that point, it doesn't matter what you do with the androgen receptor or Lupron or anything else. Nothing's going to touch it other than aggressive chemotherapy. We've never had a biomarker for it, so we've generally classified this on clinical grounds. You have no uh, PSA, you've got visceral disease, you know, but even those aren't very good indicators because I've got plenty of patients with no PSA, but I can treat them with androgen-directed therapy and shrink their measurable disease. There's RB deletion, and depending upon you know, the status of disease and, and what you read, you know, this is happening probably in about 40% of disease, but this starts to tell us about AR resistance. So the question we often get asked is, well, what do you do? Are you doing Lupron? Are you doing chemo? Are you doing Zytiga? Probably where we should get is we should be looking at the biomarkers and bucketing patients and saying, you're headed down the Zytiga pathway, Xtandi pathway, you're going to radium, you're going to docetaxel. TP53, same thing. CDK12, now this is very interesting. You know, we all want immunotherapy in prostate cancer. It doesn't work, right? You take pembrolizumab, which is all over the television, and it's approved in so many diseases, and you see a 2 to 3% resp percent response rate in prostate cancer. You talk about tumor mutational burden as the differentiator for how you should pick patients for immunotherapy. Well, TMB in prostate cancer is typically very low. You know, people say a cutoff at 10, 15. You know, prostate cancer is more like 2 to 4 TMB, low mutations. But if you have CDK12 deleted prostate cancer, what we end up seeing is that you have a fairly high, we should say really here, not so much mutational burden, but neoantigen load. You get a high frequency of tandem internal duplications. You get a high load of neoantigens generated by fusions. So you get a lot of chimeric proteins through a process of chromothripsis, and you get functional aberrant pro proteins with open reading frames that'll generate neoantigens that immunotherapy can respond to. And so what we're seeing is that CDK12 is predicting for response to immunotherapy, but when you look at your foundation or care risk report and they talk about TMB, that kind of alteration is not counted. So we're thinking these patients are immune resistant when in fact they're sensitive. MSI highs, another of the same, and in interest of time, I'll move on. So then as a medical oncologist, what I think about is how patients move between these states, how they get into one state, how, whether they stay in it, but what we also understand is that there's lineage plasticity. And this is really how we start thinking about sequencing therapy and trying to be more sophisticated with our therapies. Because as Dr. Crawford was mentioning earlier, we can talk about mutations and alterations, but the fact of the matter is much of what drives differentiation in cancers is not mutations in genes, but rather how those genes are regulated. So epigenetic regulation, the control of those genes. Most, uh, very few genes change in prostate cancer as it evolves through that state. And I didn't highlight that list of genes that doesn't change at all, but most of them stay the same, and yet you go from this Gleason 6 indolent disease to this 
you know, highly aggressive small cell cancer with brain metastases. That's not the same process, and mostly it's at epigenetic regulation. What we start to realize was something like ARV7, right? So ARV7 is an inducible biomarker of resistance to AR-directed therapy. Well, you know, ARV7 can come and go in a cancer. You treat a patient with abiraterone, suddenly ARV7 gets upregulated in the cancer cell and it's not going to respond to Abby anymore. You give them docetaxel and the ARV7 goes away. And potentially you can retreat them again with Abby or enzalutamide. Right, the tumor evolves. We're, we're, we're involved in a dance. It moves left, we have to move to block it. It moves right, we have to move to block it again. And so if we think about this in a more sophisticated fashion, where we want to get to is start doing liquid biopsies, start doing continuous monitoring, track the evolution as it's happening, and block the cancer before it makes the switch. Right? So instead of going treatment A to treatment B to treatment C and D and on down the line and then hitting hospice, you go from A to B to C and back to A, and then switch over to B in combination with C and et cetera, et cetera. Move back and forth because we're taking advantage of the plasticity of cellular evolution. All right, so in summary, inherited prostate cancer risk syndromes are underrecognized both in practice and in research. This is absolutely a problem we have to solve in terms of diagnosing patients who have germline inherited cancer predisposition genes. And this leads to delayed diagnosis and it decreases cure, right? I mean, each one of you will always cure more cancer patients than I ever will in my career, right? Once they get to me, it's too late. You guys are the ones that cure patients. So we need to identify these patients early. We need the guidelines to evolve. We need it to catch up to the data. They're very much behind Kelly. Uh, we need multiple new pathways for therapeutic. Uh, to, we need new drugs to hit these multiple new pathways. And we need future treatment paradigms to incorporate germline and somatic mutation data. Deleterious BRCA gene alterations are likely to be the first treatment selection biomarkers in metastatic CRPC. And PARP inhibitor studies are ongoing. I showed you Rucaparib, but there's Niraparib, Talazoprib, Olaparib, and all of them are being tried in prostate cancer. So the field is full of these studies right now. I think, as you all well know, you know, we start with testing these drugs in metastatic disease. But ultimately, we have to move them all forward, right? We start talking about neoadjuvant and adjuvant studies, getting these drugs earlier and earlier. And you're going to see these studies. They're already in the pipeline. The cooperative groups are working on them. The, uh, the uh, industry is working on them. So this is going to come to your clinic very, very quickly. Thank you.